Hello and welcome to Securities Training Corporation's FINRA licensing presentation for the Series 7 and 63 examination. We've designed this introduction primarily for summer analysts and associates so they can know the best practices of how to study for the examination, uh, what a little bit about the examination itself, and some of the tools and benefits of using the STC program. So uh, a couple things before we get started with the first slide, and that is uh, the amount of studying that one needs to do is going to be really be contingent upon two major factors. One is what type of degree or information did they study while college, graduate school, or law school, or in the business world. So if you've got a finance degree, it's going to be different than a liberal arts degree. If you have a law degree, it's going to be different, again, than a finance degree. If you worked as an analyst, then went back to school to get their MBA and have an MBA in finance, then it will be a little bit less study. So you got to decide what type of base knowledge did you bring in. The second factor is some of the firms have courses prior to the licensing. Some do it right away, the licensing. Some wait a little bit longer. And that is contingent upon the firm's policies and procedures. So if you've taken a class at the beginning of the firm on financial analysis or on asset allocation or on securities trading or derivatives, it may make the studying a little easier. So I thought I'd introduce that in the beginning. Okay, so the first slide talks a little briefly about regulation. And it's just sort of an open presentation because these terms are going to be used throughout the course, and we thought we'd get a good idea uh, of what that information talk discusses. And um, for example, every employee of a broker dealer is referred to as an associated person. I got that name, a person associated with a member firm. And those associated persons could be clerical, or in some cases, they're registered persons like you will be, and you will be called a Series 7 registered representative. Now, the people who supervise the individual employees are known as principals. They could be called managing directors. They could be called partners. The title doesn't matter so much as what they do, and the key is they supervise or approve certain things. The firm that employs you is called a broker-dealer. The brokerage firm, broker dealer, investment bank, all is interchangeable. Next, we have the term FINRA. FINRA is referred to, Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, as an SRO or self regulatory organization. The design is, is that the SEC, which is the, on the top here, Securities Exchange Commission, is a U.S. government agency. Realizing that they're going to be limited in their budget and limited in what they can and cannot do because of certain constraints. They delegate, and they delegate certain regulatory action and regulatory enforcement and certain rulemaking authority to FINRA. So FINRA is a self-regulatory organization, and they report, of course, to the SEC. So again, a little bit of breakdown in terms of the regulatory information, and every associated person has to be licensed depending upon what he or she does if they're not performing clerical duties. Now, the main purpose of the presentation is to talk about three things. The exam itself, both 7 and 63, our study materials and online exams, and classes. Uh, some of your firms will uh, have you attend the class. Some of your firms will have you have uh, an on-demand lecture built into the coursework. So either way, the information that you'll be presented will be enough information in order for you to successfully pass both of these examinations. So first up, about the Series 7 examination. All right. The exam itself is 250 multiple choice questions. So each question is going to have four choices, A, B, C, D. Some of the Series 7 questions might be an accept question. Some may be Roman numeral questions, still A, B, C, D where you're given four Roman numerals and it's asking you which two are the following, like a one and three, a one and four, two and three, and two and four. Now the exam, since it's 250 questions, it's too long to have one seating. So the exam is given in two three-hour sessions. And you receive your score at the end of the second session. You don't have to spend three hours. 
Most students usually take about an hour and a half, two hours, maybe a little bit longer. So you don't have to stay three full hours and you will receive your score at the end of the second session. And you will be able to review your answers, your incorrect, uh, the answers where you tag for record and review. You will be able to review certain questions and the software of the actual exam is similar to our closed book exams, which we're going to show you in a few minutes. Now, the key is the passing score. You need a 72% to pass the examination, which means 180 out of 250 multiple choice questions. We're going to hope that you're going to get at least that score, if not higher. If you listen to everything we tell you to do in this presentation and throughout the course that you'll be given, you will pass the examination. Don't take this exam lightly. It's not a, it's a challenging exam. There's a lot of information you're going to be asked. And the key is to study hard for this test. The last bullet point is heavily geared to securities professionals marketing products to individual investors. Now, we're not sure if you're going to be working in asset allocation or asset management. Uh, you're going to be in private wealth management. You're going to be on a sales desk, a trading desk. But this exam is geared to the typical registered representative or stockbroker, as they're referred to, selling a variety of securities to individual investors. That's who the majority of people taking this test is geared towards. So bear that in mind. That's the core of the exam. Now, each exam includes an extra 10 experimental questions, which are unidentified. They don't count against your score, so therefore, you really have 260 total questions, of which 250 will count, 130 in each section. Now, the key is, what are the most heavily tested areas? Well, one, municipal securities. More so than corporates and governments, you're going to have to know a lot of information about municipal securities. Not so much on the underwriting or the regulatory nature of the municipal bond market, but product knowledge how they're taxed, uh, who would purchase them, who they're suitable for. There are also questions on corporates, on uh, U.S. government securities, money market securities. So municipal securities and fixed income is a big part of that 250 questions. Second is options or derivatives. Questions dealing with who should purchase calls, who should purchase put options, who should write covered calls, what is the maximum loss on a various option position? What is the maximum profit? What are the break-even points? Please remember that not all the questions are going to be mathematical. There'll be a number of option questions on conceptual information, as well as some of the regulations of opening options accounts, options exercise, and things of that nature. Another heavy emphasis is on customer accounts. Customer accounts pertaining to the retail investor, such as what information has to be on a customer account, what type of transactions can be done in a miner's account, what can be done in a joint account, what about fiduciary accounts or retirement accounts. All that information, a customer switches from one brokerage firm to another brokerage firm, what do you do? A client contacts you and wants to enter a trade for a discretionary account. What are the ramifications of that? What documentation do you need? What needs to be signed prior to? What type of disclosure needs to be made afterwards? Second, taxation. All the various products, municipal securities, government securities, option securities. What are the tax implications? If I buy the security and I hold it to maturity, what's the tax implications? What if I sell it before maturity? What if I buy mutual funds or other variety of products? What are the tax implications? And that kind of folds into the suitability. So people always say about the Series 7, there are many, many questions on, su on suitability. Well, you can't answer questions correct on suitability unless you know the product knowledge. And the product knowledge is what are the risks and rewards? What are the advantages and disadvantages of the product? What are the tax implications on the product? So suitability really lends itself to two main other areas within that. One, what is the product? You can't know whether an annuity, a variable annuity, is suitable for someone unless you know what a variable annuity is. You can't say that an exchange-traded note is suitable or a leveraged ETF, ETF is suitable, exchange-traded funds, unless you know about the product. 
And if we're comparing government securities to mortgage-backed securities, what type of investor would purchase those, who would be suitable for, you would have to know the tax implications. And lastly on that point are various regulations. Uh, what are the regulations if I work at a brokerage firm and I want to take a client out to dinner? What are the regulations about selling new issues to various clients? What are the ramifications if I want to have outside business activity or work at some other type of uh, financial products firm? So there's a good number of questions on regulations, not so much the memorization of you know, three business days, 10 business days, when things need to be filed. There is some of that, but that's not the vast majority. The majority of the questions would be, is what you're sending to a client, is it correspondence? Is it retail communication? Is it institutional communication? Based upon what you're sending to the client, its definition would dictate, does it have to be approved? Does it have to be reviewed? What are the implications of that not as much as when things are filed. So there, is, there are regulatory questions, but more geared towards the role of a registered representative versus a supervisor exam might be, when does it have to be filed? There is some questions on days, but it's not the vast majority of the regulatory questions. And last up on that slide are some questions dealing with annuity products, which are insurance related products, generally for people's retirement and investment companies which is another term for mutual funds. Both of these terms together sometimes are referred to as packaged products. So you're buying a product which is packaged based upon a variety of securities within that. And many of your firms may not even do annuity products or very few mutual funds. Some do a lot, some do, don't do that much at all. But bear in mind that there will be a number of questions on variable annuities as they compare to fixed annuities, what are the risks with annuities? What type of products are they? What are the tax implications of those products? As well as ex investment companies would be like exchange-traded funds, exchange-traded notes, mutual funds, closed-end funds. And again, that's also tied into suitability by knowing the product knowledge of these various products as well as the tax implications. Okay, next up is a discussion about STC's material. First, the Series 7 material, the study manual. Some of your firms have purchased the written study manual. Some of your firms have purchased an online or ebook study manual. It is the same information regardless of electronic delivery or printed delivery. Each Series 7 manual contains 24 chapters. At the end of each of those chapters is a short summary test. Those questions are relatively easy and just to test your reading comprehension. And they're good questions but they're not usually as challenging as the actual test. It also contains a glossary at the end, and biz, which talks about business terms and phrases you're going to see throughout the examination. Now, although some of you are going to read various portions of the study manual, all the manual, again, depending upon your backgrounds, what we listed here was based upon those individuals in these summer programs who do, are not given that much time to study the material. So we're trying to give you some shortcuts, and that's what you would like. The most important chapters to read would be chapters 3, 4, and the end of 24, which covers the customer accounts and suitability portion. Chapters 8 through 10, which is the fixed income, and 11 and 12, which is municipals. Chapters 13 and 14, which is the most important option chapters, and chapters 18 and 20 on the annuities. Uh, I wouldn't read chapter 4. 24 on suitability until you've read all the other chapters. And the order the order could be 3 and 4, then 8 through 10, 11 and 12, 13 and 14, 18, 20, then the end of chapter 24, which is a good summary of suitability. Do not use a highlighter because it's all factual based information. Just read the material to try to get a good understanding of the concepts in the material. Okay, next up is going to be information on our practice examinations. STC has online final examinations we call practice exam. And I'm going to show you a brief, uh, brief demo uh, of going through that information in just a few minutes. Our website is www.sdcinteractive.com. 
you should have received an email from our company which contains a username and password. And once you enter that username and password, you'll be given, you'll be taken to a homeroom which will list the various courses, the Series 7 and 63 courses, which the firm has purchased for you, and the various types of products, so let's say flashcards or on-demand lectures or something else called progress exams, which your firm may have purchased for you as well. But the core, the most important, are the 12 final exams. Now, these final exams can be taken in three methods. The Q&A method, where the explanation pops up right away. There's no timer. It's graded at the end. The closed book exams, which we want you to use for the second time you go through the exams, where the exams are timed similar to the actual exam. It's the same questions but scrambled. And lastly are the by topic exams. This is the entire exam bank categorized by the various 24 chapters so the person can target the areas that they need the most help in. This is the most important component of the course. This is the key to passing the exam. Going through the exams, not memorizing the answers, but understanding the explanations of the test question. Because on the actual exam, the questions will be different. They'll be reworded differently. The facts will be the same. And you need to understand why A, let's say, is correct and B, C, and D are incorrect. What follows is a demonstration of the Series 7 final examinations. So when you get to your homeroom, you type in your, first you type in your username and password. You get to your homeroom. One of the icons will say Series STC Series 7 final exams, 41st edition. Same concept with the 63 or any other course that you need to take that your firm purchased through, uh, through STC. There are various buttons here, which are start buttons, a bookmark button, a history button, a calendar button, and of course a help button. And if you have a question, we have a user feedback button right over here. So we told you there are three ways of taking the examination. First is the Q&A, and I strongly recommend you take this one first. You click Q&A tool, and you will see there are 12 examinations. There's some instructions which you could read. So if we start in exam one, we notice here that we have one out of 130 questions. Um, these review, mark, review, all, would be at the end of the exam, which you can mark right here. Click that. You can grade the quiz. You can pause. And you would grade the quiz, of course, course at the end. So you read through the question. Here are the four choices. The question says, which of the following statements is true concerning electronic communication networks and abbreviated ECNs? And we have the four choices. And we click, and we get the answer incorrect. Now, the reason why I did that is two reasons. One is you pick D, which is highlighted, but the correct answer is B. So it does two things. One, it shows you what you chose. And two, it shows the correct answer. And here's the key. Read the explanations very carefully. The explanation would help you get that question right the next time a similar question was asked on ECNs. The number here, you can disregard. That's for STC purposes. And then you would go on to the next question. So on and so forth. Now here, we're going to choose B. And we get the question correct. And it lights up that way. And you would do this with all the questions. So you don't have to keep track of your score because at the end it would grade it. Now, if you want to take the exam's closed book, you would go back to where it says contents. You would take the closed book examinations. Now, it's the same questions, but they're scrambled. So I click question one now. 
Okay, and we're going to retake the quiz. You see there's a timer on the bottom, and you will not get your score instantaneously like you would. And you notice here, it's the same exam question, exam one, question one, but it's a totally different ex question. And we click here. We can mark for a view. We click D, and it goes to the second question. We click A, and you don't get your grade. You will not receive your grade till the end. And you can see the timer here now has 179 minutes. And remember, it's 130 questions of which you've given three hours for each. Now, lastly, is the by topic exams. And you can take 10 questions, a 20 question exam, or all the questions. The overview of financial markets and regulation has all because there's only a very few questions from a very small chapter one. So if you review all the exams and you're doing poorly, let's say, on economics and suitability, or you're doing poorly on municipal debt securities, bond types, and tax treatments, and you wanted to see all our questions, we have 109 questions on that topic, and it's similar to the Q&A where the explanations would pop up right away. The correct answer is B. I chose C. Here is the explanation. Now, if by chance you've already taken the exams, Q&A, and you're doing some of the by topic exams, you might have memorized this question. You might have gotten correct because you might have seen it two or three days ago. Make sure if that happens, you carefully reread the explanation. You do not want to get lazy and simply memorize the answer. That's not the way to pass the examination. So that concludes a little demo of the Series 7 final examinations. The 63 exams are very similar where you have the Q&A, the closed book by topic. So that would be the same. There are seven exams versus 12 exams on the 63. And the number of questions correspond to the number of questions on the actual examination. I, will want to, I do want to mention one more thing. We have a document here which is very important called Crunch Time Facts. Now the Crunch Time Facts, which I'm going to click here, will show you a PDF. And this PDF of the Crunch Time Facts is designed to provide some last minute crunch time information, sort of like a cram sheet the day or two before the exam. What facts do I need to know? And it's broken down by chapter. It is an excellent, excellent STC tool. Many people have said that they've gotten a few questions correct on the exam just by reading this document a day or so before the exam. Some people as many have said as many as 10 or 15 questions. And it's broken down by chapter. Little points like this. If a 17-year-old person whose birthday is approaching wants to open an account at the firm, the most appropriate course of action for the RR is to do what? Refuse to open the account. So the question might be pertaining to what's the best action for the RR to do? And the answer on the exam, if a question like this was posed, would be to refuse the open the account, even though they're very close to being 18, which is not being a minor anymore. And there's plenty of these in this document. It goes through all 24 chapters. Now this concludes a little information. I'm going to go back here and show you the document. And we're back to the, the homeroom. Bear in mind that the firm may have purchased something called electronic flashcards, as well as some on-demand lectures. And that information would be in your homeroom as well. And they're pretty much self-explanatory. There are instructions for each of those as you start the program. Now, the second exam some of you may be required to take is the Series 63 examination. And the Series 63 examination is not a federal exam. It's a state exam. 
instead of taking one exam in each state you're going to transact business in, like some industries do, like the real estate or the insurance business, there's one exam you need to take to be licensed as an agent in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Now, the entity that creates this exam is not FINRA. FINRA administers the exam, but does not create the exam bank or the outlines. That entity is called NASA, North American Securities Administrators Association. It is a group of 50 state administrators. Each state has their own sort of like SEC commissioner. They're called the administrator. And they have a lobbying group called NASA. And one of their functions is to create exams specifically for state licensing requirements in the securities industry. Now, the exam itself is 60 questions, and it's broken down into the following areas. Regulation of investment advisors and investment advisor reps. So the firm is an investment advisor. The people who are employed at the firm, in terms of the working persons, would be individuals such as IA reps. There are three questions on each of those two categories for a total of six questions. And that's approximately, approximately it is 10% of the examination. The second area, which is a very, very important area, is regulation of broker-dealers and agents. So broker-dealers are the firms that you work for. Agents would be yourself. So for example, on the Series 7, you're known as a registered representative. On the Series 63, you're known as an agent of a broker-dealer. Pretty much the same function, just different terminology because it's two, two different regulatory entities. And there's 18 questions there, which is 30% of the exam, a very, very important area. Then a very lightly tested area, only three questions, on regulation of securities and issuers, three questions there. And lastly is remedies and administrative provisions. There are six questions there which is 10%. So the three questions would be 5% and the six questions would be 10%. And the other two areas, which are pretty heavily tested, is communication with clients and prospects. Prospects meaning people you'd like to be clients. What are the rules and interpretative guidelines on communication with clients and prospects? That's 12 questions or about 20% of the examination. And the last category is ethical practices and obligations, which are 15 questions, which are broken down into four categories. We do not know how many questions of the 15 are in each of the four categories because NASA outline does not present that. And that would be compensation, how agents are compensated, two, customer funds and securities, safekeeping and things of that nature, three, conflicts of interest and other fiduciary duties, of agents and IA reps, and lastly, cyber security and protection of client data. And that 15 questions represents 25% of the examination. So that's a total of 60 questions. And just like the Series 7, there are some experimental questions. So the time limit is one hour and 15 minutes. Uh, it is sufficient time. Uh, most people finish in about an hour or so. It's sufficient time but now there's, there's not an overabundance of time. The passing score is 72%. And lastly, there are five experimental questions, which are not counted. So again, 65 questions, an hour and 15 minutes, only 60 of those questions count. Okay, our study material for the Series 63 consists of a written manual and online exams. Now, before we go through that, let's talk about some generalities about the examination. The Series 63 does not test federal law. It tests state law. So there's very little overlap with the Series 7. There is some overlap, but it's not identical because one is testing federal law, Series 7, and the other is testing state law, which is the Series 63. There are seven chapters and six online exams. And again, read the material. Do not memorize the details in the book. Read the entire manual. 
concentrate on those areas of the heavily tested, like the regulation of broker dealers and agents and the unethical practices, the, communica uh, the communication rules and things of that nature, and concentrate on state regulation and what's referred to as the Uniform Securities Act. And what the Uniform Securities Act is, is a model law. Instead of having 50 different state laws, which some they could theoretically have, there's one uniform act that the states adopt. And in some cases, they may make slight moderate modifications in that law, but that's what's tested on the exam, the Uniform Securities Act. And also NASA has a bunch of what's called statement of practices. Statement of practices or policies on unethical business practices of broker deals and agents. Unethical business practices of custody of funds and securities. Many of the questions on the exam are based upon those guidelines which we have written our test questions and study material on. Make sure, just like the Series 7, you complete the exams in the Q&A format and then the use the by topic and closed book exams to target your weaknesses. And you want to be scoring good scores on the exam well above the 72% needed to pass. Now, in a minute, I'm going to talk about the grading and how that works and grading on our test versus the actual examination. Lastly, on the Series 63, some students find this exam very tricky. So it's not so much the content per se, there is some, that, but a lot of it is the trickiness of the questions, some double negatives, written differently than the Series 7. The Series 7, if you know the content, the exam questions tend to be, in most cases, straightforward. The 63, the quantity of material is much, much smaller, but the questions could be very tricky. So you really want to read the questions very, very carefully. One last point about the Series 63 on the bottom of this slide, uh, and we can kind of summarize it then, is the main focus, of course, is state registration, securities fraud, prohibited practice. Again, another retail-oriented exam as well, just like the Series 7. So I just wanted to point that out. Didn't mention that earlier. Okay, the last thing we want to talk about in concluding this introduction presentation is scoring and the possibility of what's going to go on at class if your firm takes uh, has paid for a class for you. Most people, when they take either the Series 7 or Series 63 exams that we have at STC, the first time they do these tests, they score sometimes in the 50s or 60s, sometimes in the low 70s, and people get very nervous. We design our exams, in most cases, to be more challenging than the actual test. So the key is not so much when you take exams the first time and the Q&A, is when you take those exams close book, and you may not be able to do all 12, but you want to do all the exams open book and a few close book, and when you do the closed book exams, you want to be scoring in the mid-70s or in the 80s. The first time around, we're not as concerned the second time around, we want to make sure you're scoring in the 70s and 80s. And if you do that, you will be passing the examination. And that is the key. The more you do, the more comfortable you're going to be with the material. The more comfortable you are with the material, the easier it is for you to pass the exam. Most students, a year or two after they take and pass the exam, always tell their uh, associates at the firm, well, it's not that difficult to test. I didn't study that hard. In reality, they did. It's simply a function of what people remember and what they forget a few years after they take the exam. Most students, when they actually pass the exam that initial time, will say, I'm glad I really studied, and I'm glad I really studied hard. They may not tell their friends and associates how hard they study, but they do study hard. Second is classes. Classes are great ways of prepping for the test. We recommend that prior to the class, You've read through the manual and the most important parts of the manual for the Series 7. Then have taken a few of the exams prior to the class. And then every evening you do homework of doing exams every night. And hopefully they give you a few days between the end of the course and the actual exam. You can review all the material for both the class and the online exams. Now, one of the reasons we want you to do a few exams before the course 
is because each of you might have different information that you're struggling with. Some people might be struggling with options. Some people were struggling with customer accounts or suitability. And when we cover those areas on the exam, uh, in the class, we want to make sure we strengthen your knowledge and also help you to understand why you got that question wrong when you've taken the exam before. You know, as an instructor, there's nothing more gratifying than this situation, whether it's the Series 7 or Series 63. So you're teaching a class, and the concept you're teaching, let's say, is municipal securities. And you're explaining them the difference between an auction rate security and a variable rate demand obligation. And while you're teaching that concept, a student, he or she raises their hand, says, you know, I was doing an exam yesterday or the night before, two days before, and I got a couple of questions wrong on that. Can you explain why one is more liquid than the other? And then we answer that question. The great thing about that is that person is guaranteed to get that question right in the exam on that concept because they knew they needed help in then in that concept and they struck to help them in order to pass the exam. The more people that raise their hands with those type of questions, the happier the instructor gets because he or she, that instructor, is really honing in on what the students need to pass the exam. And our goal here at STC is onefold, to get you to pass whatever licensing exam you need to pass. 763 or whatever exam it is, that is our function, that is our goal. Now, some of your firms do the Series 7 training, then the exam, then the 63 training, then the exam. Some people do 7 training, 63 training, then both tests afterwards, depending upon the schedules. Either way works. We're here to help. If you have any questions, want to contact us, our phone number is 1-800-STC-1223. Contact any of our customer service people. Contact any of our instructors. We are here to help. That is our goal. Good luck. Please contact us. And I look forward to seeing you in class. And I hope that I'm lucky enough to have you in one of my classes.